Sorry about that. Good morning, Pals TV. So um, glad everybody's uh, back and hopefully you guys all had a spectacular week. The weather was uh, um, holding up pretty nice for all of us and we are in the start of Shark Week. So happy Shark Week, everyone. If you don't know about Shark Week, it's uh, one of my favorite TV events all week, all sharks and uh, um, Last night, Mike Tyson was uh, getting getting in the water. So there, there's always some uh, good stuff on Shark Week. And uh, um, I know sharks are, are definitely something that I, I feel um, have been interesting across the, over the, the years. We've, we've learned more about sharks, more about their behaviors. And uh, um, I think we're starting to finally recover from the uh, just absolute mindless uh, shark uh, scare from uh, that 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 happened from Jaws. But uh, if you uh, do get some uh, time at night and you you can't get outside and can't get some exercise, I think that's a great uh, event as well. If you're not already watching Pals TV uh, reruns, so uh, reminder: we do have uh, some of our greatest hits up on the uh, website, and you can always uh, watch some of our old episodes on YouTube. Uh, we have a great lineup today at the start of season 16. We have uh, Amanda continuing her story, A Wrinkle in Time. Uh, we have the Silver Bridge Sessions and Gallia. We have some trivia and Caddis. And uh, we have some cooking class and sprinkling some dancer size in Columbus. So lots of uh, fun stuff going on. We're going to uh, head over to Steubenville where uh, our one of our favorite hosts, Amanda, will be taking over this morning. So how are you this morning, Amanda? I am wonderful, and it's good to see all of your smiling faces. Hello, hello, hello. So last week when we were reading The Wrinkle in Time, I asked people to draw what they thought, you know, Mrs. Who, Mrs. What's It, and Mrs. Which looked like. And who did anyone draw their pictures of what they thought they looked like? Give everyone a couple minutes, see if anyone comes up with anything. All right, let's see here. Caitlin, what do you got? I read a book last night. Oh yeah? Did you finish it? Not yet. Not yet? All right. Well, we'll keep reading today and see where we are. We're getting close. Well, we're not getting close to the end. We're at about the middle of the book at this point. But we'll get there. All right, so let me share my screen with you guys so you guys can see. Share. All right, do you guys see the book? All right, excellent. So I'm going to bring you guys see here. I'm going to bring you guys down here to the bottom. Ooh, this makes it difficult. Hold on. You guys are so big, you block my screen. So maybe up here. Okay, that looks better. So we're going to start off where we left off. We're about halfway through. Let's see. All right, so here we are, we're on our next page. 
Meg felt Calvin's arm circle her waist in a secure hold. Still, they moved upwards. Now they were in the clouds. They could see nothing but drifting whiteness, and the moisture clung to them and condensed in icy droplets. As Meg shivered, Calvin's grip tightened. In front of her, Charles Wallace sat quietly. Once he turned just long enough to give her a swift glance of tenderness and concern. But Meg felt as each moment passed that he was growing farther and farther away that he was becoming less and less her adored baby brother and more and more one of the whatever kind of being Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Which actually were. Abruptly, they burst out of the clouds into a shaft of light. Below them, there were still rocks. Above them, the rocks continued to reach up into the sky. But now, though it seemed miles upward, Meg could see where the mountain at last came to an end. Mrs. Wetsit continued to climb, her wings straining a little. Meg felt her heart racing. Cold sweat began to gather on her face, and her lips felt as though they were turning blue. She began to gasp. All right, children, use your flowers now, Mrs. Wetsit said. The atmosphere will continue to get thinner from now on. Hold the flowers up to your face and breathe through them, and they will give you enough oxygen. It won't be as much as you're used to, but it'll be enough. Meg had almost forgotten the flowers and was grateful to realize that she was still clasping them, that she hadn't let them fall from her fingers. She pressed her face into the blossoms and breathed deeply. Calvin still held her with one arm, but he too held the flowers to his face. Charles Wallace moved the hand with the flowers slowly, almost as though he were in a dream. Mrs. Wetsit's wings strained against the thinness of the atmosphere. The summit was only a little way above them, and then they were there. Mrs. Wetsit came to rest on a small plateau of smooth, silvery rock. There ahead of them was a great white disk. One of Uriel's moon, Mrs. Wetsit told them, her mighty voice faintly, faintly breathless. Oh, it's beautiful, Meg cried. It's beautiful. The silver light from the enormous moon poured over them blending with the golden quality of the day, flowing over the children, over Mrs. Wetsit, over the mountain peak. Now we will turn around, Miss Wetsit said, and at the quality of her voice, Meg was afraid again. But when they turned, she saw nothing. Ahead of them was the thin, clear blue of sky, below them the rocks thrusting out of the shifting sea of white clouds. Now we wait, Mrs. Wetsit said, for sunset and moonset. Almost as she spoke, the light began to deepen, to darken. I do not want to watch the moon set, Charles Wallace said. No, child, do not turn around, any of you. Face out toward the dark. What I have to show you will be more visible. Look ahead, straight ahead, as far as you can possibly look. Meg's eyes ached from the strain of looking and seeing nothing. Then above the clouds which encircled the mountain, she seemed to see a shadow, a faint thing of darkness so far off that she was scarcely sure she was really seeing it. Charles Wallace said, what's that? That sort of shadow out there, Calvin gestured. What is it? I don't like it. Watch, Mrs. Wetsit commanded. It was a shadow, nothing but a shadow. It was not even as tangible as a cloud. Was it cast by something or was it a thing itself? The sky darkened, the gold left the light and they were surrounded by blue. Blue deepening until where there had been nothing but the evening sky, there was now the, a faint pulse of a star, and then another, and another, and another. There were more stars than Meg had ever seen before. The atmosphere is so thin here, Mrs. Wetsit said, as though in answer to her unasked question, that it does not obscure your vision as it would at home. Now look, look straight ahead. Meg looked. The dark shadow was still there. It had not lessened or dispensed with the coming of light. And where the shadow was, the stars were not visible. What could be about a shadow that was so terrible that she knew that there had never been before or ever would be again? Anything that would show her with a fear that was beyond shuddering, beyond crying or screaming, beyond the possibility of comfort? Meg's hand holding the blossom slowly dropped and it seemed as though a knife gashed through her lungs. She gasped, but there was no air for her to breathe. Darkness glazed her eyes and mind, but as she started to fall into unconsciousness, her head dropped down into the flowers, which she was still clutching. And as she inhaled the fragrance of their purity, her mind and body revived and she sat up again. 
the shadow was still there, dark and beautiful. Calvin held her hand strongly in his, but she felt neither strength nor reassurance in his touch. Beside her, a tremor went through Charles Wallace, but he sat very still. He shouldn't be seeing this, Meg thought. This is too much for so a little boy, no matter how different and extraordinary a little boy. Calvin turned, rejecting the dark thing that blotted out the light of the stars. Make it go away, Mrs. Wetzit, he whispered. Make it go away. It's evil. Slowly, the great creature turned around so that the mountain was behind them, so that they saw only the stars unobscured, the soft throb of starlight on the mountain, the descending circle of the great moon swiftly slipping over the horizon. Then, without a word from Mrs. Wetzit, they were traveling downward, down, down. When they reached the corona of clouds, Mrs. Wetzit said, you can breathe without the flowers now, my children. Silence again, not a word. It was as though the shadow had somehow reached out with its dark power and touched them so that they were incapable of speech. When they got back to the flowery field, bathed now in starlight and moonlight from another smaller, yellower, rising moon, a little of the tenseness went out of their bodies, and they realized that the body of the beautiful creature on which they rode had been as rigid as theirs. With a grateful, graceful gesture, it dropped to the ground and folded its great wings. Charles Wallace was the first to slide off. Mrs. Who, Mrs. Witch, he called, and there was an immediate quivering in the air. Mrs. Who's familiar glasses gleamed at them. Mrs. Witch appeared too, but as she had told the children, it was difficult for her to materialize completely. And through there was the robe and peaked hat. Meg could look through them to the mountain and stars. She slid off Mrs. Wetzit's back and walked, rather unsteadily after the long ride, over to Mrs. Witch. The dark thing we saw, she said, is that what my father is fighting? Chapter five, the Tesseract. Yes, Mrs. Witch said, he is behind the darkness so that even we cannot see him. Meg began to cry, to sob aloud. Though her te through her tears, she could see Charles Wallace standing there, very small, very white. Calvin put his arms around her, but she shuddered and broke away, sobbing wildly. Then she was enfolded in the great wings of Mrs. Wetzit, and she felt comfortable, comfort and strength pouring through her. Mrs. Wetzit was not speaking aloud, and yet through the wings, Meg understood words. My child, do not despair. Do you think we would have brought you here if there were no hope? We are asking you to do a difficult thing, but we are confident that you can do it. Your father needs help, he needs courage, and for his children, he may be able to do what he cannot do for himself. Now, Mrs. Witch said, are we ready? Where are we going, Calvin asked. Again, Meg felt an actual physical tingling of fear as Mrs. Witch spoke. We must go behind the shadow. But we will not do it all at once, Mrs. Wetzit comforted them. We will do it in short stages. She looked at Meg. Now we will test her. We will wrinkle again. Do you understand? No, Meg said flatly. Mrs. Wetzit sighed. Explanations are not easy when they are about things for which your civilization still has no words. Calvin talked about traveling at the speed of light. You understand that, little Meg? Yes, Meg nodded. That, of course, is the impractical long way around. We have learned to take shortcuts whenever possible. Sort of like in math, Meg asked. Like in math, Mrs. Wetzit looked over at Mrs. Who. Take your skirt and show them. La experiencia es la madre de la ciencia. Spanish, my dears. Cervantes. Experience is the mother of knowledge. Mrs. Who took a portion of her white robe in her hands and held it tight. You see, Mrs. Wetzit said, if a very small insect were to move from the section of skirt in Mrs. Who's right hand to that in her left, it would be quite a long walk for him if he had to walk straight across. Swiftly, Mrs. Who brought her hands still holding the skirt together. Now you see, Mrs. Wetzit said, he would be there without that long trip. That is how we travel. So a lot of this book, guys, I'm gonna take a moment, is gonna talk about a tesseract and tessering. So if you look at this top picture up here, you can see that long string that's pulled apart. So if you were the little ant going across the long string, that would take you a long, the ant, a long time to walk from one end to the other. 
But when you bring the string together, like you see in this picture down here, the ant doesn't have to go as far to get from one place to another. So that is what tessering is. And that's what they're talking about when they talk about a tesseract. They're wrinkling time and making it so you can get from one place to another really, really fast. Almost kind of like if I were going to describe it to someone, almost like, um, oh, what's the word where you materialize one place and dematerialize in another? Tell, transport. What's that word? Somebody help me. Hold on. What is it? They do it in uh, Star Trek. Help me. Caitlin, what is it? Huh? Push port. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what that is, okay? Teleport. That's what it is. That's the word I wanted to use, teleport. Kind of like teleportation. All right, so I'm going to keep reading now. Charles Wallace accepted the explanation serenely. Even Calvin did not seem perturbed. Oh dear, Meg sighed. I guess I am a moron. I just don't get it. That is because you think of space only in three dimensions, Mrs. Wetzit told her. We travel in the fifth dimension. This is something you can understand, Meg. Don't be afraid to try. Was your mother able to explain a tesseract with you? Well, she never did, Meg said. She got so upset about it. Why, Mrs. Wetzit? She said it had something to do with her and father. It was a concept they were playing with, Mrs. Wetzit said, going beyond the fourth dimension to the fifth. Did your mother explain it to you, Charles? Well, yes, Charles looked a little embarrassed. Please don't be hurt, Meg. I just kept at her while you were at school till I got it out of her. Meg sighed. Just explain it to me. Okay, Charles said. What is the first dimension? Well, a line. Okay, what is the second dimension? Well, you'd square the line. A flat square would be in the second dimension. And the third? Well, you'd square the second dimension, then the square wouldn't be flat anymore. It would have a bottom, sides, and a top. And the fourth? Well, I guess if you want to put it in mathematical terms, you'd square the square. But you can't take a pencil and draw it the way you can the first three. I know it's got something to do with Einstein and time. I guess maybe you could call the fourth dimension time. That's right, Charles Wallace said. Good girl. Okay, then for the fifth dimension, you'd square the fourth, wouldn't you? I guess so. Well, the fifth dimension is a tesseract. You'd add that to the other four dimensions, and you can travel through space without having to go the long way around. And otherwise, to put it into Euclid or old-fashioned plane geometry, a straight line is not the shortest distance between two points. For a brief illuminating second, Meg's face had the listening, probing expression that was so often seen on Charles's. I see, she cried. I got it. For just a moment, I got it. I can't possibly explain it now, but there for a second, I saw it. She turned excitedly to Calvin. Did you get it? He nodded. Enough. I don't understand it the way Charles Wallace does, but enough to get the idea. Give me one second, guys. Thank you. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So now we go, Mrs. Witch said. There is not all the time in the world. Could we hold hands, Meg asked. Calvin took her hand and held it tightly in his. You can try, Mrs. What's it said, though I'm not sure how it will work. You see, though we travel together, we travel alone. We will go first and take you afterward in the backwash. That may be easier for you. As she spoke, the great white body began to waver, the wings to dissolve into mist. Mrs. Who seemed to evaporate until there was nothing but glasses. And then the glasses too disappeared. It reminded Meg of the Cheshire cat. I've often seen a face without glasses, she thought, but glasses without a face? I wonder if I go that way. Two, first me, then my glasses. 
she looked over at Mrs. Witch. Mrs. Witch was there, and then she wasn't. There was a gust of wind and a great thrust and sharp shattering as she was shoved through what? Then darkness, silence, nothingness. If Calvin was still holding her hand, she could not feel it. But this time she was prepared for the sudden and complete disillusion of her body. When she felt the tingling coming back to her fingertips, she knew that this journey was almost over and she could feel again the pressure of Calvin's hand about hers. Without warning, coming as a complete and unexpected shock, she felt a pressure she had never imagined, as though she were being completely flattened out by an enormous steamroller. This was far worse than the nothingness had been. While she was nothing there, was no need to breathe. But now her lungs were squeezed together so that although she was dying for want of air, there was no way for her lungs to expand and contract. To take in the air, she must have to stay alive. This was completely different from the thinning of atmosphere when they flew up the mountain and she had to put the flowers to her face to breathe. She tried to gasp, but a paper doll can't gasp, she thought. She was trying to think, but her flattened out mind was as unable to function as her lungs. Her thoughts were squashed along with the rest of her. Her heart tried to beat. It gave a knife-like sidewise movement, but could not expand. But then she seemed to hear a voice or if not a voice, at least two words flattened out like printed words on paper. Oh no, we can't stop here. This is a two-dimensional planet and the children can't manage here. She was whizzed into nothingness again and nothingness was wonderful. She did not mind that she could not feel Calvin's hand, that she could not see or feel or be. The relief from the intolerable, intolerable pressure was all she needed. Then the tingling began to come back to her fingers, her toes. She could feel Calvin holding her tightly. Her heart beat regularly, blood coursed through her veins. Whatever had happened, whatever mistake had been, it was over now. She thought she heard Charles Wallace saying, his words browned and as full as spoken words ought to be. Really, Mrs. Witch, you might have killed us. This time she was pushed out of the frightening fifth dimension with a sudden immediate jerk. There she was herself again, standing with Calvin beside her, holding on to her hand for dear life. And Charles Wallace in front of her, looking indignant. Mrs. Whatsit, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch were not visible, but she knew that they were there. In fact, the fact of their presence was strong about her. Children, I apologize, came Mrs. Witch's voice. Now, Charles, calm down, Mrs. Wetsit said, appearing not as the great and beautiful beast she had been when they last saw her, but in her familiar wild garb of shawls and scarves and the old tramp's coat and hat. You know how difficult it is for her to materialize. If you are not substantial yourself, it is very difficult to realize how limiting protoplasm is. I am sorry, Mrs. Witch's voice came again, but there was little, there was more than a hint of amusement in it. It's not funny, Charles Wallace gave a childish stamp of his foot. Mrs. Who's glasses shone out and the rest of her appeared more slowly behind them. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, she smiled broadly. Prosperer in the Tempest. I do like that play. You didn't do it on purpose, Charles Wallace demanded. Oh, my darling, of course not, Mrs. What's it said quickly. It was just a very un understandable mistake. It's very difficult for Mrs. Witch to think in a corpor corporeal way. She wouldn't hurt you deliberately, you know that. And it's really a very pleasant little planet and rather amusing to be flat. We always enjoy our visits there. Where are we now then, Charles Wallace demanded, and why? In Orion's Belt, we have a friend here and we want you to have a look at your own planet. When are we going home, Meg asked anxiously. What about mother? What about the twins? They'll be terribly worried about us when we didn't come in at bedtime. Well, mother must be frantic by now. She and the twins in Fort will have been looking and looking for us. And of course we aren't there to be found. Now don't worry my pet, Mrs. What's it said cheerfully. We took care of that before we left. Your mother has had enough worry with her and you and Charles to cope with and not knowing about your father without us adding to her, her anxieties. We took a time wrinkle as well as a space wrinkle. It's easy to do if you just know how. What do you mean, Meg asked plaintively. Please, Mrs. Wetsit, it's all so confusing. Just relax and don't worry over things that needn't trouble you, Mrs. Wetsit said. We made a nice, tidy little time tester. And unless something goes terribly wrong, we'll have you back about five minutes before you left. So there'll be time to spare and nobody will ever need know you were gone at all. 
So of course, you'll be telling your mother, dear lamb, that she is. And if something goes terribly wrong, it won't matter whether we ever get back at all. Don't frighten them, Mrs. Witch's voice came. Are you losing faith? Oh, no, I'm not. But Meg thought her voice sounded a little faint. I hope this is a nice planet, Calvin said. We can't see much of it. Does it ever clear up? Meg looked around her, realizing that she had been so breathless from the journey and the stop on the two-dimensional planet that she had not noticed her surroundings. And perhaps this was not very surprising. For the main thing about the surroundings was exactly that they were unnoticeable. They seemed to be standing on some kind of nondescript flat surface. The air around them was gray. It was not exactly fog, but she could see nothing through it. Visibility was limited to the nicely definite bodies of Charles Wallace and Calvin, the rather unbelievable bodies of Mrs. What's It and Mrs. Who, and a faint occasional glimmer that was Mrs. Witch. Come children, Mrs. What's It said, we don't have far to go and we might as well walk. It will do you good to stretch your legs a little. As they moved through the grayness, Meg caught an occasional glimpse of slag-like rocks, but there were no traces of trees or bushes, nothing but flat ground under their feet, no sign of any vegetation at all. Finally, ahead of them, there loomed what seemed to be a hill of stone. As they approached it, Meg could see that there was an entrance that led into a deep, dark cavern. Are we going in there? She asked nervously. Don't be afraid, Mrs. Wetsit said. It's easier for the happy medium to work within. Oh, you'll like her children. She's very jolly. If I ever saw her looking unhappy, I would be very depressed myself. As long as she can laugh, I'm sure everything is going to come out right in the end. Mrs. Wetsit came Mrs. Voice, Mrs. Witch's voice severely. Just because you are very young is no excuse for talking too much. Mrs. Wetsit looked hurt, but she subsided. Just how old are you, Calvin asked her. Just a moment, Mrs. Wetsit said, murmured, and appeared to calculate rapidly upon her fingers. She nodded triumphantly. Exactly 2,379,152,497 years, eight months, and three days. That is according to your calendar, of course, which even you know isn't very accurate. She leaned closer to Megan Calvin and whispered, it was really a very great honor for me to be chosen for this mission. It's just because of my verbalizing and materializing so well, you know. But of course, we can't take any credit for our talents. It's how we use them that counts. And I make far too many mistakes. That's why Mrs. Who and I enjoyed seeing Mrs. Witch make a mistake when she tried to land you on a two-dimensional planet. It was that we were laughing at, not you. She was laughing at herself, you see. She's really terrible nice to us younger ones. Meg was listening with such interest to what Mrs. Wetsit was saying that she hardly noticed when into they went into the cave. The transition from grayness of outside to the grayness of inside was almost unnoticeable. She saw a flickering light ahead of them, ahead and down, and it was towards this that they went. As they drew closer, she realized that it was a fire. It gets very cold in here, Mrs. Wetsit said, so we asked her to have a good bonfire going for you. As they approached the fire, they could see a dark shadow against it, and as they went closer still, they could see that the shadow was a woman. She wore a turban of beautiful pale mauve silk and a long flowing purple satin gown. In her hands was a crystal ball into which she was gazing raptly. She did not appear to see the children, Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch, but continued to stare into the crystal ball. And as she stared, she began to laugh. And she laughed and laughed at whatever it was she was seeing. M Mrs. Witch's voice rang out clear and strong, echoing against the walls of the cavern, and the words fell with a sonorous clang. We are here! The woman looked up from the ball, and when she saw them, she got up and curtsied deeply. Mrs. Wetsit and Mrs. Who dropped small curtsies in return, and the shimmer seemed to bow slightly. Oh, medium dear, Mrs. Wetsit said, these are the children, Charles Wallace Murray, Charles Wallace ball, bowed. Margaret Murray, Meg felt as if Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Who had curtsied, she ought to also. So she did, rather awkwardly. And Calvin O'Keefe, Calvin bobbed his head. We want them to see their home planet, Mrs. What's It said. 
The medium lost the delighted smile she had worn till then. Oh, why must you make me look at unpleasant things when there are so many delightful ones to see? Again, Mrs. Witch's voice reverberated through the cave. There will no longer be so many unpleasant things to look at if responsible people do not do something about the unpleasant ones. The medium sighed and held the ball high. Look, children, Miss Watson said, look into the well. Que la terra es petite et cou a la voix de six de l'île. How small is the earth to him who looks from heaven, Mrs. Who intoned musically. Meg looked into the crystal ball at first with caution, then with increasing eagerness as she seemed to see an enormous sweep of dark and empty space and then galaxies swinging across it. Finally, they seemed to move in closer on one of the galaxies. Your own Milky Way, Mrs. Wetsit whispered to Meg. They were headed directly towards the center of the galaxy. Then they moved off to one side. Stars seemed to be rushing at them. Meg flung her arm up over her face as though to ward off the blow. Look, Mrs. Witch commanded. Meg dropped her arm. They seemed to be moving in toward a planet. She thought she could make out polar ice caps. Everything seemed sparkling clear. No, no, medium dear, that's Mars, Mrs. Wetsit reproved gently. Do I have to, the medium asked. Now, Mrs. Witch commanded. The bright planet moved out of their vision. For a moment, there was the darkness of space, then another planet. The outlines of this planet were not clean and clear. It seemed to be covered with a smoky haze. Through the haze, Meg thought she could make out the familiar outlines of the continents like pictures in her social studies books. It is because of our atmosphere that we can't see properly, she asked anxiously. No, Meg, you know that it's not the atmosphere, Mrs. Witch said. You must be brave. It's the thing, Charles Wallace cried. It's the dark thing we saw from the mountain peak on Uriel when we were riding on Mrs. Wetsit's back. Did it just come? Meg asked in agony, unable to take her eyes from the sickness of the shadow which darkened the beauty of the earth. Did it just come while we've been gone? Mrs. Witch's voice seemed very tired. Tell her, she said to Mrs. Wetsit. Mrs. Wetsit sighed. No, Meg, it hasn't just come. It has been there for a great many years. That is why your planet is such a troubled one. But why, Calvin started to ask, his voice croaking hoarsely. Mrs. Wetsit raised her hand to silence him. We showed you the dark thing on Uriel first, oh, for many reasons. First, because the atmosphere on the mountain peaks there is so clear and thin, you could see it for what it is. And we thought it would be safer for you to understand it if you saw it, well, someplace else first, not on your own earth. I hate it, Charles Wallace called, cried passionately. I hate the dark thing. Mrs. Wetsit nodded. Yes, Charles, dear, we all do. That's another reason we wanted to prepare you on Uriel. We thought it would be too frightening for you to see it, first of all, about your own beloved world. But what is it, Calvin demanded? We know that it's evil, but what is it? You have said it, Mrs. Witch's voice rang out. It is evil. It is the powers of darkness. But what's going to happen, Meg's voice trembled. Oh, please, Mrs. Witch, tell us what's going to happen. We will continue to fight. Something in Mrs. Witch's voice made all of the children stand up straighter throwing their shoulders with determination, looking at the glimmer that was Mrs. Witch with pride and confidence. And we're not alone, you know, children, came Mrs. Wetsit, the comforter. All through the universe, it's being fought, all through the cosmos, and my, but it's a grand and exciting battle. I know it's hard for you to understand about size, how there's very little difference in the size of the tiniest microbe in the greatest galaxy. You think about that, and maybe it won't seem strange to you that some of our best fighters have come right from your own planet. And it's a little planet, dears, out on the edge of a little galaxy. You can be proud that it's done so well. Who have our fighters been, Calvin asked. Oh, you must know them, dear Mrs. What's it said. Mrs. Who's spectacles shone out at them triumphantly. 
and the light that shineth in darkness, and the darkness co darkness comprehend it not. Jesus, Charles Wallace said? Why, of course, Jesus. Of course, Mrs. What's it said. Go on, Charles, love. There were others. All of your great artists, they've been fights for us to see by. Leonardo da Vinci, Calvin suggested tentatively, and Michelangelo. And Shakespeare, Charles Wallace called out, and Bach, and Pastor, and Madame Curie, and Einstein. Now Calvin's voice rang with confidence, and Schweitzer, and Gandhi, and Buddha, and Beethoven, and Rembrandt, and St. Francis. Now you, Meg, Mrs. What's it order, ordered? Oh, Euclid, I suppose. Meg was in such agony of impatience that her voice grated irritably, and Copernicus. But what about father, please? What about father? We are going to your father, Mrs. Witch said. But where is he? Meg went over to Mrs. Witch and stamped as though she were as young as Charles Wallace. Mrs. Watson answered in a voice that was low but quite firm, on a planet that has given in, so you must prepare to be very strong. All traces of cheer had left the happy medium's face. She said that sat holding the great ball, looking down at the shadowed earth, and a slow tear coursed down her cheek. I can't stand it any longer, she sobbed. Watch now, children, watch. And we will start off next week when we read on chapter six. I'm going to shut, stop my screen share with you. I don't want to get too far into a chapter. Uh, let me hold on. Let, oh, hold on, stop share. Okay, Caitlin, I see your hand up. You're What's up, darling? Huh? Right now, right? You're we are going to be, hold on. This will be, yes, chapter six is what we'll be starting I'm next week. Chapter 11. Oh, good job. Because I have the book right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. I've got mine on an internet app. Um, but I might have to make you read one of these weeks, Caitlin. We'll <laughs> take care of it. We'll get you to read. All right, let's see here. I see Dusty. He's got a picture up. Uh, what's up, Dusty? Yeah. How do you think my picture? I think it looks good. So tell me uh, who's on the pictures. Point them out to me. Mrs. What's it? Charles Wallace, Mrs. Who, Mrs. Murray. Okay, good job. Excellent. I love the picture. So are you guys liking the book so far? Yeah. Everyone liking it so far? Book? Huh? What's the name of the book? The name of the book is called A Wrinkle in Time, and its author is Madeline Liangville. Okay. Caitlin's okay. holding up her book right there, actually, and you can see a little bit of the uh, front of it. Pull it back a little bit, Caitlin, so you can see. There you go. It's actually within um, about two or three years ago, it was made into a movie through Disney. But I personally think the book is way better. How about you, Caitlin? Do you like the book better than the movie? They changed a lot of stuff in the movie. Yeah, I like the book better than the movie. You like the book better? Me too. They, okay, hold on. Let me see here. I see Nick. Hi, Nick. Hey. Hey. I'm good. Are you liking the book so far? Hey. I have, I have book. Mm. That's good. I'm glad you're liking the book. All right, let's see here. Gila, I saw your hand up. You liking the book, Gila? I think it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah? I'm glad you're liking it. Like I said, it's this is one of my favorite books. I read it. Um, I've read it when I was younger. I read I actually I read I, it a couple I, of years I, ago. Okay, I read it. Okay. Oh, okay, that's good. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah, it's a really good, really good. Way. Yeah, it's good. So. That's good. All right. Well, I love hanging with you guys. I see Jonah back. Hi, Jonah. Hey, Amanda. So, skipping ahead, are there sharks involved in this? There are book? no sharks. No okay. sharks. Fair enough. Okay. You know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a shark week failure, you know, I didn't plan for shark week. <laughs> Nick, Nick says, thumbs down. What, you don't like sharks, Nick? <laughs> He's not a fan of sharks. All right, fair enough. Well, here's the thing. I got rid of my cable a couple weeks or a couple years ago, so I don't get Discovery Channel anymore. Shark week's a, 
a far distant memory. Okay, Caitlin, you had a question? I passed, so I got no, uh, Kentucky. No, you didn't. No, no, Are you no, serious? You pet a shark? I know for aquarium. Whoa. I there pet you a go. shark too, Caitlin. You petted a nurse shark probably. Yeah. Yeah. I know for aquarium. I love no for aquarium. Yeah. Wow. Have, you ever have you ever petted the stingrays and the eels in the pool yeah. too? Yeah. That's pretty cool to do. Mm -hmm. That would be a very cool experience to, to get to pet a shark. I have, I have yet to pet a shark. Um, hopefully I'd never pet one in the wild, but, uh, um, you know, maybe I can try to, try to find an aquarium that'll let me touch one. Uh, I'm on chapter 11 on this book. Whoa. All right. Yeah, she's, ahead. she's been running ahead. Yeah. Uh -huh. I like to read. <laughs> well, don't, don't be giving away any endings or. or I won't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I told her, Jonas, and she's reading so far ahead, I'm going to make her read a chapter one of these weeks. It's coming. There you go. I like that. She's She's got all the, the goods, you know. She's got yep. more info on uh, Wrinkle in Time. She is our, our uh, most experienced shark handler on Pals TV, being that uh, uh, Caitlin has touched the shark. So, I mean, she, uh, she should be uh, definitely a guest host. So... That's all we have uh, this morning for our first session. Golf clap for Amanda. Thank you for coming on and um, starting us off the right way. So we'll be back at the top of the hour. I'll let you guys uh, socialize for a little bit. Stick around. We got a lot of good stuff coming. I'll see you guys soon. Bye, everyone.